All right, Luke chapter 19, verse 29. Next, let's look at verse 28. It says, When they had thus spoken, he went before ascending up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass when he was come nigh to Bethpage and Bethany at the mount called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go ye into the village over against you, in the which at your entering uh, ye shall find a colt tied whereon yet never a man sat. Loose him and bring him hither. And if any man ask you why you loose him, thus shall ye say unto him, Because the Lord hath need of him. And when they were sent, they went their way and found even as he had said unto them, and as they were loosing the colt, the owners thereof said unto them, Why loose ye the colt? And they said, The Lord hath need of him. And they uh, brought him to Jesus, and they cast their garments upon the colt, and they sat Jesus thereon. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And when he was come nigh, even now unto the descent of Mount Olivet, of Mount of Olives, of the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that he had seen, saying, Blesses the king that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd be with me this morning as I stand before your congregation. I pray that you'd help me to stand in the power of the Spirit of God as we look into this blessed event from nearly 2,000 years ago. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to glean some things from this event that'll help us in our walk with you. And Lord, I pray especially that there's one here who needs to know you as their personal Savior. I pray that today would be that day of salvation for them. I pray, Lord, that they find rest, not day or night, Lord, until they find refuge in your wonderful, marvelous, matchless grace. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray these things. Amen and amen. Now, there's a lot of things I could preach about when it comes to Christ's triumphant entry into Jerusalem. But this morning, I want to focus upon one thing that happened when he rode in. As he rode in, the people began to shout and praise the Lord. Uh, as we ought to be accustomed to, to, to shouting too. I mean, we ought to lift up the Lord Jesus Christ every single day. As we have our song service in church, you ought to lift your voice up loudly uh, so that you can magnify the Lord Jesus Christ and, and sing praises unto him. There's nothing more disheartening uh, than looking uh, out and seeing folks sitting like this uh, while everybody else is praising the Lord. We ought to lift up our voice. We call that worship. We ought to shout. That's what I like as a preacher hearing people say amen. That's a form of shouting. Amen. amen. I, like, I like that word. If you want a preacher to preach hard, uh, you give him a bone and say amen when you agree with what he's saying. Uh, some folks, uh, they shout without even saying anything at all. They just lift their hand up like that. I like that. That's glorifying God. Uh, some folks don't shout or raise their hand, but you can see it in their eyes as their eyes get all misty. And I tell you what, a tear trickles down the cheek. I believe that's a way of praising God too. I believe that's a way of a shout. And then some folks just smile really big, I think, uh, when the Lord's dealing with their heart. And I believe that's also a type of shouting unto the Lord. Say amen if you agree with that. Now, when I think about praising the Lord, I think of Psalm 107. In Psalm 107, there's a phrase that's repeated often, and that phrase is this, Oh, that men would praise Him. Oh, that men would praise Him. And I still say we ought to praise Him. I agree with the psalmist. I agree with these people who are standing beside the roadside saying glory to God. Hosanna unto the King. We should do the same, folks. Amen. A church shouldn't look like a, a funeral service. A church shouldn't look like a, uh, like a place of downcast uh, people meeting together. No, we should be victorious people. We should be shouting. We should be praising the Lord. We should have smiles upon our frowny faces. Amen. Or the formerly frowny faces, rather. Here in our text, uh, they are shouting, 
Glory to God. Hosanna to the king. And then the Pharisees spoke up and said, Stop that shouting. Stop praising God. Uh, uh, he said to Jesus, Don't let that crowd holler no more. Now there's some people like that, I believe. They don't like shouting. They don't like people lifting up the Lord Jesus Christ. But I tell you, if you don't like that, you better not go to heaven. Because when you get to heaven, I can guarantee you there's going to be a lot of shouting and there's going to be a lot of praising the Lord. You may not like singing, but you're going to get a whole a heap of singing around the throne of God as the saints of God join in in one accord and sing that new song up in glory. Amen. And I'm looking forward to all the shouting that's going to happen up in heaven. Now wait a minute. Let's stop a second. I'll tell you what causes shouting in heaven. You'll know what causes shouting in heaven. Not necessarily my preaching. Now I hope you like my preaching. I hope they're pleased with it up there. But the Bible never says that they're shouting in heaven when a preacher preaches. Or singing. The Bible doesn't say that they shout up in heaven when they hear our singing. They might be thinking, man, them people can't sing. I can't wait till they get up here and get them glorified voices. <laughs> It's not our, our singing. It's not our Sunday school teaching. It's not anything we do. But when an old sinner comes to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says they're shouting in the presence of the angels. They're shouting over one sinner who comes trembling to the Lord Jesus Christ. Heaven gets a shouting at that point. But I tell you what, in the church today, when somebody gets saved, everybody's all quiet and sitting solemn as a tomb. I tell you what, we ought to rejoice with them. A lost sheep that was lost out on the hills of sin has been found. That lost coin that was lost in the dirt and the muck and the mire and the darkness uh, was brought to light and found. We ought to rejoice. I tell you what, Christians, and I've said this before, shouldn't look like they've been weaned on dill pickles. Christians ought to rejoice. We ought to be the happiest people in all the world. Now, notice when Jesus said, if these folks stop shouting, the rocks will stand and sing praise to me. If these hold their peace, the rocks are going to gonna shout and declare of my glory. Something's going to praise God, even if it has, if it has to be the rocks. You say, well, how can a rock shout? A rock doesn't have a mouth. Well, I agree with you. But I tell you what I think about what my papa said one time, Brother Clyde. He said, uh, he said he was reading that verse and all of a sudden he started thinking about going down the interstate. And you know, I'll probably know where I'm talking about there. I think it's four, is it 40 or 640? You go down 640, there's a rock bluff. Up on that rock bluff, it's painted John 3:16. Amen, that rock is surely professing and glorifying the Lord. And I tell you what, if the rocks can do it, the saints of God ought to be able to do it. Amen. Let's lift up and glorify the Lord Jesus Christ in this dark world. And we're living in a dark world. We're living in a world uh, that just cares nothing about God. We're living in a world that is spiraling away from Him. We're living in dark times. Yes. But I tell you what, Christians, we're to shine a light in those dark times. If we're going to shine a light in those dark times, we're going to have to lift up the Lord Jesus Christ above all the noise and the din and the darkness and the fog of this world. As the devil has blinded the minds of them that believe not, we are to manifest the Lord Jesus Christ in our actions and in our words and in the way we have our attitudes. We should praise the Lord. Now, something's going to shout. Whether you're going to shout or not, something's going to shout. The Bible says that during the reign of Christ, when the curse is, curse is lifted, uh, that the trees are going to clap their hands. Isn't that going to be a spectacular time? In other words, the trees are going to shout and rejoice and praise God. Right now, you know, all of the creation groans, it says over in Romans. It groans because it's under the curse. But one of these days, Christ is going to make all things new. And the trees are going to clap their hands and the mountains are going to sing. Oh, what shouting and singing when the King of kings and Lord of lords sits upon his throne, folks. He didn't sit on his throne after riding in Jerusalem. 
No, uh, they mocked him, ridiculed him. Instead of putting a royal diadem upon his brow, they put a crown of thorns and pressed it down. Instead of putting a scepter, a royal scepter, in his hands, they put a reed in his hand and they pulled the reed from his hands and smacked him in the face with it. Instead of sitting upon the throne, Christ Jesus was crucified upon a cross to pay for the sins of all the world. But one of these days, folks, he will wear many, wear many crowns upon his head. One of these days, folks, he will have a rod of iron in his almighty hand. One of these days, he will sit upon an everlasting throne. He will never advocate that throne. No, he'll sit on it from everlasting to everlasting. Amen. What a glorious time that is. But I told you, say, I'll praise the Lord then. Well, why don't you start right now? I'll magnify the Lord then. Well, why not start doing it now? I'll talk about the Lord then. No, start talking about Him right now. Lift Him up in this world, folks. The Bible says rejoice not because the, because the devils and demons are subject to you, but shout because your name's recorded in heaven. Amen. Is your name recorded in heaven? If you were to walk up in the heaven's courts and open that Lamb's book of life, would your name be written in there when permanent ink? Amen. If it is, you ought to shout. Yep. You know what? I think about that first century church. I tell you, what, that's what I want this church to be is a first century church. You can keep your 21st century nightclubs that call themselves churches. I want to be a first century church. Right. I want this place to have an atmosphere of worship of the Lord, not the atmosphere of the world. I want something that's real, but I think about that first century church. They suffered persecution like you couldn't imagine. Like you couldn't imagine. I think about Paul and Silas there in jail with their backs bleeding uh, with open wounds where they had been whipped. You know what they did? They praised the Lord. They began to sing. They had their song meant so much that it convicted the heart of the jailer there when God had set them free. You know, I tell you what, I believe there'd be a lot more conviction in this world if we as Christians rejoiced in the Lord. If we magnified His name and gave out that glorious gospel. Matter of fact, that's a great form of praise, isn't it? I'm thankful we have something worth shouting about, aren't you? It's worth shouting about. I tell you what, you go to the ball game and uh, if somebody scores a touchdown, there's all kinds of shouting in there. Why? Because they're happy about the touchdown. Their team has went ahead. Or if you're at Tennessee, their team has finally scored. But there's a lot of shouting. There's a lot of energy around that because it's what they care about. If Christians cared half as much, There'd be a lot of glorifying God out in the world, wouldn't they? There'd be a lot more glorifying God in the pew, but also out there in the other places. We lift up the Lord Jesus Christ. We'd sing. We'd live for Him. Amen. We'd magnify Him. But I'm afraid we don't do that. You may ask, preacher, do you think it's important that we praise God? I say, yes, it is. David thought it was important. Once again, Psalm 107, I mentioned it earlier, the phrase, oh, the men would praise him is repeated over and over again. It talks about some travelers that are lost and they need a guide and they, they, they go to the Lord in prayer and the Lord uh, sends them in the right direction. And then David says, oh, the men would praise him. I'm glad that when I was going the wrong direction, Christ turned me in the right way. I said he turned me in the right way. I didn't say I turned myself in the right way. No, he turned me in the right way. He talks about captives needing to deliver in verses 10 through 16 of that chapter. Amen. Captives need to I, I was captive to sin. But when, uh, the, the, when they prayed to God, God came down and broke their bands asunder, it says in that song. And then it says, oh, the men would praise him. Well, I was a captive to sin. I called upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He broke my bands asunder. I ought to praise him. Amen. It talks about some afflicted people in that chapter in verses 17 through 22. But then the sweet physician comes by their way and heals them of their sickness. I'm glad when I was sin sick. When the whole head was sick and full of putrefying sores, 
The Lord Jesus Christ came with his balm and he healed me and patched me all up. Oh, the men would praise him. Then lastly in that chapter in verses 23 and 30, there's some sailors, a storm comes and they're all worried and they think they're going to perish so they go to the Lord in prayer and the Lord delivers them out of the storm. Amen. Oh, the men would praise him, David says. They all to praise him. They were delivered. Well, I was in a storm too. I was in a storm of sin. I was heading towards the rocks. I was going to be dashed to pieces. I was going to find myself in hell. Uh, but praise the Lord. He came and delivered me from that storm. Amen. I ought to praise him. Moses and the host of Israel knew what it was to praise the Lord. It's all throughout the Bible, folks. There they are. God had delivered them from Egypt. They had uh, taken spools from the Egyptians. They were on their way to the promised land. But then all of a sudden they found themselves backed up to the Red Sea. And, and all of a sudden Egypt's decided they're going to come down hard upon uh, the Israelites and crush them there. But then God told Moses to stand still. He raised the staff above his head and God parted the waters. Notice I said God parted the waters, not Moses. Amen. The waters parted. Then God, in His great mercy that goes all the way, not, uh, caused the, the, dry, the, the ground to dry where they had tread. He breathed down there. Huh? They didn't have to walk through the mire. But they had to walk on solid ground through the sea. They walked through uh, on the dry ground. And then when they got through on the other side, the Bible says that God closed that wall of water upon their enemies. And you know what they did because of that? The Israelites sang. Amen. There's a whole song that records the song that they sang as they walked through that, that wall of water and as they reached the other side as God delivered them uh, from the, the uh, Egyptians. Amen. That's what He did for you. Amen. Pharaoh is a great picture of the devil. You were captive to him. You were his slave. But Jesus Christ, by great victory through His marvelous grace in His finished work upon Calvary, delivered you from the hands of Pharaoh. Amen. Shouldn't you praise Him? Amen. We spend our whole lives trying to glorify ourselves. We spend our whole lives on uh, doing stuff for our own flesh. We've in essence, as a community, made our God our own belly. Right. But what we should do is lift up Christ. Didn't Jesus say, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me? I know he's talking about being lifted up upon Calvary since he was lifted up on Calvary. And by the way, Calvinist, you take that one. Amen. He said, I'll draw how many men to me? All men unto me. Not part of them, all of them. But they have to receive him. He ain't going to make them receive him. He's given them a choice. But anyways, if you see what God's done for you, and you understand what it is, you ought to praise Him for it. Amen. I tell you what, we're too quiet about what God's done for us. When the woman at the well met the Lord Jesus Christ and He gave her that water of life springing up within her soul and everlasting life, you know what she did? She left those water pots behind and she took off back to the town of Sychar and said, let me tell you about this man. Huh? Amen. That's what happened. When the maniac of Gadara was changed, he couldn't wait to get back and tell everybody what God had done for him. We need to brag on the Lord, folks. Amen. But we want to brag on what we did. It's all of a sudden, oh, what we did. You know, I read a book one time about, uh, how, I think it's called How to Win Friends and Influence People or something like that. And in that book it says uh, the people's favorite topic is always the same. You know what their favorite topic is? Themselves. That's your favorite topic because uh, you have the old nature. But what you shouldn't, you should fight that old nature. You should feed the new nature. You should let the Holy Spirit shine forth. And if you let the Holy Spirit lead you in your life, Christ will be the main topic. Amen. That'll be what you want to talk about. Amen. Amen. Y'all remember that old song, Tell Me the Story of Jesus? Right on my heart, every word. It talks about people hungering and thirsting at it. And it's the old, old story. It never gets old. Now, let's get back to our text. 
Here Jesus going back to Jerusalem. He's going to be crucified shortly. But as he goes, the Bible says he rode through the city on a donkey. The people shouted praises to him. The king of glory, they said. Behold the king of glory. They shouted Hosanna. The Bible says they shouted. They took uh, palm branches in their hands and they waved them. They put their coats out in front of him so he could ride across those coats. But there were some in that crowd that didn't like the praise. They didn't want to see Jesus get the glory. Let me say to you, dear friend, the Lord Jesus Christ deserves all the praise. And these people that stood there in the streets of Jerusalem, they couldn't be quiet. They had to glorify the Lord. They had to cry hallelujah. Because they were so enamored of it. Now, I don't know who was all in that crowd. I know the disciples uh, were, were shouting and praising the Lord, but there was a multitude there, it says. I don't know who was in it, but there was very likely there was a few Bible characters there that were not told about in that great multitude. Now, I'm going to speculate a little bit this morning that you'll just have to bear with me because the point is a biblical point. I believe that there was a little boy standing there on Palm Sunday. I can see him clapping his hands as he says, Hallelujah uh, to the King of glory that cometh in the name of the Lord. I can see a Pharisee come up to that little boy and say, Son, you're going to have to stop that shouting. You're going to have to stop doing that. Stop giving glory to this, this man upon this donkey. He's not who he says he is. But I can see that little boy say, Mister, I just can't keep my mouth shut. <laughs> You see that man riding on that donkey right there? One day I came to him with five barley loaves and two fishes. And I saw that man take those five barley loaves and those two fishes and I saw him start to break that bread and I saw that bread multiplied and I saw that bread feed 5,000 people. I can't keep my mouth shut about it. He deserves all the honor and glory. You just keep your mouth shut. I'm going to praise his name, the young man uh, probably uh, said about this uh, man. man trying to tell him to be quiet. Mr. I'm going to praise his name. Don't, I don't think that little boy could stop praising the Lord after all he did for him. I don't think we should be able to praise him. After all, he, multi he multiplied our blessings like he did that boy. Amen. We had very little when we came to Jesus, but God made it into uh, many and manifold blessings. I didn't have nothing when Jesus found me. Amen. 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 I didn't have enough to get into heaven, certainly enough. I didn't have enough to feed myself, let alone others. But when Jesus came, He gave me the bread of life. He gave me of Himself. He gave me more than I ever could have imagined. And I tell you, that little boy couldn't shut up, neither can I. Amen. <laughs> I see another person in this crowd. And it, it, this happened very close to where they're at. Very likely in this crowd, this multitude of people, uh, there was a, another man. And if you see this man, if you look by faith and you use your imagination, you can see him grinning from ear to ear. There's no scowl on this man's face. Only joy being reflected from what's in his heart. He was not always this happy, but I can see him with this palm branch waving it like this. Huh? As he praises the Lord and says, Glory to the Lord, uh, Hosanna to the highest that comes in the name of the Lord, I can see a Pharisee say, Why don't you just hush? Why don't you just hush up? Why are you shouting about that man right there? Don't you know he blasphemes the Lord? Don't you know he's a friend of sinners? And I can see him say, That's why I love him so much. Amen. He's a friend of sinners. He came to where I was. When everybody else rejected me, that man uh, didn't reject me. He says, perhaps uh, y'all have seen me before I met that man upon that donkey. I lived in the tombs, Amen. in a place of death. He said, I cut myself, I tried to harm myself, and the villagers, uh, they chained me up. And they had such hate and animosity toward me, uh, but I was bound to sin. As much as I was chained by men, I was chained by Satan. 
I was a wild man. I was cast out of my home. My children were afraid of me. But one day I peered over into the ocean and I saw a ship a sailing. And while that ship was a sailing, a, a storm blew upon it. And it was tossed to and fro. And I, as I looked, I saw a man stand up. That man on the donkey. He stood up, held his hand above his head. He said, peace be still. And the waters were calm. Amen. He said, that got my attention. He might have said, I'll tell you something about that man on that donkey. That man, as he stilled that storm up on the waters, also still sealed the storm. Stilled the storm that was in my life. My life was filled with storms as I was filled with demons. I'm glad that same man that stilled the, sealed, uh, the, stilled the sea stilled that storm within my soul. Amen. Have you been there? Do you have a storm within your soul? If you don't know Jesus, I tell you what, you're in the darkest of storms. The God of this world has blinded your mind. And you're sailing toward the reef. The reef of sin that will be your undoing. And you won't sink down into the waters, no. Without Christ, you'll sink down into the lake of fire itself one day. If He brought you out, if He saved your life like He did that maniac, he, 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 you, you ought to rejoice and praise Him for it. Amen. <laughs> this man may have said, that man on the donkey saved me, changed my life. Now I can go back home. Amen. Imagine being cast out of your home. I, I, he, maybe He said something like this. I, my kids used to be afraid of me, but now they come up and hug me around the neck when they see me. They have a new daddy because of that man on the donkey. I now have a happy home. That's why I'm shouting. And that's why you ought to shout. You may not have had a legion of demons uh, dwelling within your flesh. But I tell you what. You were bound for the same hell. But Jesus Christ stilled that storm in your heart. Amen. Oh that men would praise him. Let's think about another person who could have been in that crowd. You say, who's that straight lady standing over there with her palm branch? She's got it high up in the air because her back's so straight and her posture is so perfect. The people, the Pharisees say, well, what meaneth the shout? She says, I'll tell you what I'm shouting about. I'll tell you why I'm glorifying that man upon that donkey there. I had an issue of blood and I was bent over double in pain. I spent all I had on doctors and was none the better. And when I heard this new doctor was in town, the great physician, I knew if I could just touch his garment, I'd be changed. She said there was such a crowd. I couldn't get to him. There was a great press, uh, but I reached with all of my might and I touched just the barely the hem of his garment and he made all the difference in my life. Amen. I'm glad I touched him by faith one day. Amen. Hey man, I touched the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the great physician, and he wrought great health, spiritual health within my soul. Amen. I had nothing to pay. She spent all she had. She said, I had nothing to pay, but he healed me anyway. Amen. I tell you what, as a sinner, I had nothing to pay. My righteousnesses were as filthy rags. I was without strength, but in due time, Christ died for the ungodly and made a way of salvation for me. We ought to praise Him. I see another in this crowd, and I'm going to make this the last one because I can go all day with this. But I see a bright-eyed man holding up both hands. Don't have a palm, but he's got his hands up. That's the way I'm imagining it. Pharisees say, why are you shouting? Well, he could have broke into a song if he knew the song. He could have said, one sat alone beside the highway begging. His eyes were blind, the light he could not see. He clutched his old rags and shivered in the shadows. But Jesus came and set his captive soul free. Amen. When Jesus comes, the tempter's power is broken. When Jesus comes, the tears are wiped away. Amen. Amen. That's what he could have sung. He said, I was blind. I couldn't see. And oh, the shame of begging. I didn't want to beg. I wanted to work. But I had no way. But that man on that donkey right there passed by my way one day. Amen. He put mud in my eyes. 
baptized, I said, go wash in the pool of Siloam. And when I did, I came away seeing. Amen. See, I did it His way, and it made all the difference. Amen. You know, doing it God's way makes all the difference. It wasn't that he was saved by doing what Christ said by the works themselves. It was that he believed what he said. And that's how any man saved, folks. Now let's sum this up. We should shout and praise the Lord because of his multiplying of blessings. That's why the little boy would have shouted. Amen. Amen. Hadn't he multiplied your blessings? You say, I ain't had much good happen to me here recently. Well, you may not have had many th good things happen recently in the flesh, but I tell you, if your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life, you're better off than the richest man upon the face of the earth. Amen. They, they repossessed my car, preacher. I ain't got nothing to be happy about. Well, I tell you, you may not have a car down here on earth, but you got a white horse up there that's going to ride behind King Jesus one day on his white horse. Right. Amen. We shout because of his peace. We shout because of his healing. We shout, shout because we were blind, but now we see. Amen. That's why we shout. Now let's hit, hit three other things real quick. Now I believe the church has lost its shout. Amen. I believe many Christians have lost their shout. It's sad when you see a Christian lose his shout. Amen. That means they're not excited anymore. That means they're not in love with Jesus the way they were before. They've forgotten what all he's done for them. That's when you lose your shout. Uh, somebody, a Christian who's lost his shout is a defeated Christian. Amen. I don't want to live that way, do you? Amen. I think about Elijah. Elijah, li Elijah lived a life of power. But one day he lost his shout and sat under that, that juniper tree. Lost his shout and nothing was getting done there for a little bit. Is that where you're at? Have you lost your shout? It's a terrible place. I think about 1 Samuel chapter 4. When the Philistines were, were beginning to, uh, to win the battle against the Israelites, the Israelites said, send for the ark of God. And they sent for the ark of God and then came the ark of the covenant, you know that golden box. And when it came into the, into the city, you know what the Israelites did? They shouted. Amen. And when the Israelites shouted, the Philistines said, uh-oh. God's coming to the camp. Amen. I tell what you can tell whether or not God's in the camp by the climate, the spiritual climate of the people. Amen. The devil is fearful of the shout of the people of God. He knows that God's in the camp. However, in 1 Samuel chapter 4, we see that they soon lost their shout. Why did they lose their shout? Well, they treated God like a genie. Right. You know Christians like to treat God like a genie, don't they? Now, genies ain't real. They're mythology, but I tell you what, many people treat God that way. You know, you get the genie in the lamp, and uh, the person rubs the lamp, and what happens? The genie comes out. The genie grants wishes to them. A lot of people, they try to keep God in the lamp. They try to keep God somewhere hid. And when they feel like they need Him, they pull Him out. You follow what I'm saying? They weren't thinking about God, the Israelites. Then they sent for the ark. Of course, that ark represented God, so they shouted. But they soon lost that shout because God wouldn't bless them because they weren't living for Him all the time. They were putting Him off and putting Him on. Let Christians do that. We put Him off and put Him on. Oh, it's Sunday morning. They put on Jesus like they put on their suit. Huh? They put on Jesus like they put on their dress. I tell you what, y'all have Jesus all over you all the time. Say Amen. When they lost their shout, they lost three things. They lost the battle. They went to fight and then they lost the battle because they lost their shout. Amen. The Bible says in Nehemiah 8.10, the joy of the Lord is our strength. If you've got no joy in the Lord, you're not going to have the strength to battle this present evil world. Right. We're on the winning side, yet we act like we, we're defeated all the time. It's time to get out of this, uh, this rut of defeat. And it's time to be the victorious Christians that God wants us to be. Amen. When they lost their shout, 34,000 of them died in one day. 
And I tell you what, when the Christians lose their shout, when they quit magnifying the Lord, uh, there is tons of people die and go to hell because they haven't been hearing the message. Amen. The Bible says where there's no vision, the people perish. That vision needs to be put forth. Y'all with me tonight, this morning? Yeah. Amen. They also lost the ark. That, that represented the presence of God when they quit shouting. They lost their shout and they lost the ark. They lost the, the presence of the Lord. Now, a Christian is always saved. If they're saved, if you get saved one time, you stay saved forever. Amen. You say amen to that because it's the truth. Right. Christian never loses their salvation. Amen. But they certainly can lose fellowship with God. Amen. If they let sin get in the way, they can lose the joy of salvation. They can lose that presence. They can even lose their communication with God. Sin can separate you from that. I believe it's 1 Peter where it says that if you have a bad relationship with your spouse, it can hinder your prayer life. It says it. They lost the presence of God. Now later on, the Bible says that after the, there's a funny story with the Philistines. I think it's funny. If you was a Philistine, you wouldn't think it's too funny. They tried opening the ark up and God smote them with hemorrhoids. I don't know. I, I wouldn't definitely want that to happen. But anyways, uh, finally, the ark comes. They, they, they get tired of the ark being there. And the world does get tired of God. Because God stands for holiness and the world wants sin. But they send the ark away and it comes to a man's house named Abinadab. And while it was at Abinadab's house, you know what? God blessed the household of Abinadab. See, the presence of God brings a myriad of blessings in the life of those who have the shout. If you go to church and God's not there, you might as well go home. Amen. And when you sing and God's not in it, you might as well shut up. Amen. It's time to get back the presence of God in everything we do. It's time to get back that lost shout. It's time to get back that glory. I think about uh, Eli and Hophni in that same uh, chapter over in Samuel. When the ark of God is taken, that represents the presence of God departing from Israel. It says that the, uh, Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas all die that day when the ark's taken. Phinehas' wife, she was pregnant and she went into labor and she had a child and she didn't even regard the child. She said, name it Ichabod. And you know what Ichabod means? The glory of the Lord's departed. They lost their shout and the glory of the Lord departed. We need the glory of the Lord here, don't we? We need it here. We need Him here. We need His presence. We don't need to be like that church in Revelation where Jesus is outside knocking trying to get in. No, we need His presence here. Many churches don't need to go ahead and write Ichabod right above the door frame coming in because the glory of God's gone. It's all filled with the glory of man and the glory of man should be down in the dust. Amen. God should be high and lifted up. When there was, uh, we, we, we see the law, shall we hear a loud shout? Now this is what we need. We need a loud shout. In Joshua chapter 6, we were talking about this the other day. I don't know who I was talking to about it, but about Joshua. Joshua was obedient to God, went into the promised land, leading God's armies. And they come to this uh, great walled city called Jericho. And this wall was so thick you could ride, I think it was two chariots side by side on top of that wall. God said, I want you to march one time a day around the walls of that city for six days. Once around it for six days. Seventh day, I want you to walk around that thing, march around it seven times, and then I want you to blow trumpets. And what did he want them to do? Yeah. Want them to shout. Right. And when they were obedient to God, and they shouted, the walls of that city fell down flat. No doubt there were a scoffing people all about up on top. I can see them up on the walls. The Bible don't tell us this, but I can imagine with my own imagination them saying, what are them fools down there doing? They really think that's going to intimidate us? They really think that's going to help them? And all that doubt, but I tell you what, when they obeyed God and the shout came, the walls fell. Amen. No matter how strong and tall the walls of Satan are, They'll fall when Christ is magnified. When he's lifted up, the devil has his stronghold in this.
this world and we look at it and we say, the devil's winning. No, the devil is not winning. He may have taken some ground because we've lost our shout. But I tell you, if we get that shout back, we can see him on the run. So we talked about the lost shout, the loud shout, but let's talk about one more thing as we close, the loud, the Lord shout. Now, the Lord shouted, you know that? When you think of Jesus, you think of him being meek and lowly, don't you? And his first coming. Now, when he comes back, he's not going to be meek and lowly. He came as a lamb the first time, a meek lamb. But when he comes back, he's going to be the lion of the tribe of Judah. Amen. Matter of fact, he's not lowly right now either. He sat at the right hand of the throne of God a power. But he did make himself meek and lowly as he walked here among us for 33 and a half years. But one time he shouted at Lazarus' tomb, didn't he? The Bible says literally he cried with a loud voice. He said, Lazarus, come forth. And you know what happened? Lazarus came forth after four days with not the smell of corruption on him at all. He comes forth at Christ Jesus' command. And that miracle, it mirrors what Christ does when a lost sinner trusts Christ. He comes forth. Amen. See, a sinner is dead in their trespasses and sin. And when uh, we obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, believing on Him that He died on the cross for our sins and rose again from the dead, we come forth a new creature. Amen. Amen. The corruption of the world ought to be gone. But also mirrors a future shout. The first thing Jesus is going to do when He gets back and He steps off on that cloud of glory is He's going to shout. Amen. Amen. First thing he's going to do, and then when he shouts, there's going to be three things that happen. There's going to be a resurrection. Amen. See, a, a Christian, when they die, as the world says death, says death, they don't really die. The body dies. Amen. The body dies, but the soul is absent from the body, present with the Lord. Amen. The Bible puts it this way. Our, our bodies are a tent that we live in. The tent is getting old. It's getting thread born. As we get older and older, it's going to fail. Amen. But when it does, we just move out of that tent and we go to a house in the heavens. Amen. Amen. To that old body, worn out, dead, it's put down in the ground. It's just like a, a tulip bulb. You take a tulip bulb, it looks dead, don't it? No life really to it. Put it down in the ground, you bury it. When spring comes, that bowl breaks forth with life and out comes a tulip. Beautiful tulip. Same thing with the body, folks. Amen. Gonna be planted in the ground. When Jesus shouts, though that body's gonna raise incorruptible, it is incorruptible put on incor this corruptible put on incorruption, this mortal will put on immortality, that body's gonna be changed, fashioned unto Christ, like Christ's glorious body, that soul be united with that body, and you'll be a perfect person from there and forth, Christian. Amen. There'll be a resurrection at the shout of God. There'll be a reunion at the shout of God. Huh? I'm looking forward to that reunion, aren't you? I look right now and I can see pews where people I love dearly are not here anymore because they're up in heaven. I miss their fellowship. One of these days we'll have it restored. There'll be a reward up there in heaven too. So, in closing, have you lost your shout? Do you have something to shout about? Have you been living in the doldrums? It's time to come out. It's time to live in a place of glory. It's time to lift Him up. It's time to make our voice heard, folks. As this world continually blasphemes God, as this world continually spiles away from Him, let's draw closer. And as they try to put Him down, let's raise Him up in these last days. Amen. Let's pray.